name is uh, Mark Brown, and I'm a board member of both the Walnut Creek Library Foundation and the Walnut Creek Historical Society. And I can't tell you how excited I am to be uh, having Jim speak tonight about his book, about his grandfather, Robert Noble Burgess. This is a product of almost four years of work and research, some of which he did do at the Walnut Creek Historical Society. And I think you'll agree at the end of this presentation how formative Robert Noble Burgess and Jim have been in the development of Walnut Creek and the surrounding areas. I want to extend a special thank you <coughs> to our live program sponsors, Walnut Creek Historical Society, Minuteman Press, and the East Bay Times. Uh, Jim is going to talk about his book about the life of Robert Noble Burgess, which chronicles the remarkable career of a businessman whose vision and skill helped to transform Contra Costa County from a sleepy little farming community and a ranching community into the vibrant commercial <coughs> and cultural hub that it is today. This also includes donating land for the very, almost the very first, I've been corrected several times, the second site for the Walnut Creek Library. <laughs> but I think that's noted and important and in the book. So read the book and you can get this accurately. <laughs> Robert Noble Burgess, often referred to as RN by Jim in the book, is Jim's maternal grand, uh, grandfather. <clears throat> And I think you'll agree he rose rapidly in his chosen fields of agriculture, real estate, and finance in the early years of the 20th century, then suffered a dramatic collapse of his businesses and personal influence from which he really never fully recovered. And the important thing about Jim's book is it's just not a narrative of that uh, chain of events, but Jim adds the added insight of being a commercial real estate executive himself and the way he describes all the different complex financial transactions that Burgess went through, it's almost like you're reading a Harvard Business School case study. I mean, it's very interesting in detail. <clears throat> At least that's the impression I got. I happen to be a financial advisor for Merrill Lynch and somewhat of a dilettante compared to the detail that uh, Mr. Burgess and Jim did in his own commercial real estate career. Jim is a resident of Walnut Creek and a retired commercial real estate executive. His 45-year professional career included employment at Crown Zellerbach, Xerox, Cushman and Wakefield, and finally as chief operating officer of Bedford Property Investors. Jim significantly has been very connected and in charge of the Walnut Creek Library Foundation's endowment, and I might add a significant contributor to our library. <clears throat> he was a co-chair of the capital campaign for three years, board president for four years, and a board member for 15 years. He was also, I might add, uh, at one time, the president of the Lindsay Wildlife Museum Board of Directors, and he's been involved in too many charities I don't have time to mention. He was born in San Francisco, raised in Walnut Creek, served as an officer in the Marine Corps. Please help me welcome to the stage, Jim Moore. Thank you, Mark, for that kind invitation, and thank you um, for uh, bringing your colleagues from the Walnut Creek Historical uh, Society to join us at the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. And Greg, Nerland, wherever you are, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come tonight and talk to you about my, my book. Um, um, Susan or Greg asked me if I wanted to make any introductions at the beginning, and I and, and I don't, but after I said I didn't, I, I do want to recognize one person who's in our audience um, tonight, and that um, is my research assistant, my daughter, Mercedes Devine, who is, uh, raise your hand, Mercedes, who got, uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks to her competence with the, um, all the esoterica of uh, computer research and so forth. I, she got me into doors I never would have gotten in um, and helped us. My plan tonight is to speak to you for a little more than 35, 36 minutes or so, and then open it up for any questions and discussions that you uh, would like to have. Um, uh, I wrote this book because I wanted to understand my grandfather as a human being. He had written uh, himself his memoirs um, in about 1963 and 4, in the years immediately preceding his death in 1965. Um, but the mystery of RN's life, uh, the challenge that drew uh, me as a research person 
into it was the question of what happened to him to cause his uh, collapse. He went into bankruptcy, was placed into bankruptcy in December of 1920, um, but there was much more to it than that. Bankruptcy, of course, carried a much greater stigma in the 1920s than it does today after the reforms in the 1960s. So he was essentially an outcast, but it was more than that. He was essentially banished from his peer group. He couldn't borrow a nickel in the Bay Area. Literally for the next 25 years, he didn't come back to the Bay Area. He made his living elsewhere in the country, finally coming back to work on the Lakewood project. So the question, the research question was, well, what was it that was in there? that caused those things to happen and caused his peer group and his friends, his professional associates, to turn their back on him. The memoirs uh, is, is, uh, are replete with references to the, uh, the, the kind of business that, we, that he was in, the technical details of the, of the transactions and so forth, but they're silent as to any really forthcoming evidence or information about his specific role um, uh, and potentially culpability, if any, in, in the uh, end result. Um, that was what attracted me to it. I'll talk about four things tonight. I'd like to do a brief thumbnail on what I consider to be his major accomplishments, um, talk a little bit about a, his personality, um, discuss briefly his marriage to Ann Webster Fish, and then uh, come back to that original question of what was it that really happened to him, sort of behind the memoirs, if you will. Indeed, I think I entitled a chapter that. Aaron Burgess led an extraordinarily um, accomplished, and my hearing aid battery warning has just gone off. <laughs> so if you, if you see me glancing askance at my notes, it's because I'm getting signals in my ear. Please help me ignore them. Uh, he, he led an extraordinarily rich um, and productive life in its first half. Uh, Seth Adams at Save Mount Diablo has um, informed us that at the high point of his career, he controlled in excess of 38,000 acres of land in Contra Costa County and Alameda County. Um, this must have been probably in the time between 1911 and 1914 or so. <clears throat> he began to build seriously after uh, the catastrophe of 1906. This is a picture of the Palace Hotel on the morning of April 19th um, of that year, <clears throat> the day after the earthquake. On seeing the smoke from the horizon in his home in Walnut Creek at the homestead, RN thought Oakland was a fire, got in his buckboard and headed west. Coming through the um, intercounty tunnel, he discovered it was San Francisco, engineered his way onto a fireboat, and got over in the city at about one or two in the morning, or three or four, made his way to the Palace Hotel in search of his uncle Albert, who was the house physician there at the time, on an unsuccessful quest to find Albert. This picture was taken several hours after that period. <clears throat> the tragedy, which cost literally hundreds of thousands of San Franciscans their home, was the catalyst for the beginning, the dawning of a, of a significant uh, career in real estate and real estate finance for RN. In, two th in 1912, RN bought the Oakwood Stock Farm, which was a 1,500-acre parcel on the southwest slopes of Mount Diablo, the site of the Mount Diablo Country Club today. Two years later, he um, undertook to create a relationship with this man. This is William Randolph Hearst uh, on a photograph taken at about the time of his partnership with RN. RN describes a four-hour um, horseback ride with just the two of them up Mount Diablo <clears throat> in which I, I think they both must have been trying to sell the other on the <clears throat> grand schemes and plans that they had for the development of that piece of real estate. In the end, um, they struck a deal under the terms of which RN would sell his Diablo holdings, which at that point encompassed almost all the mountain, including the summit, to Hearst. But Hearst would not pay for it in cash. It was a million and a half dollar deal. Hearst was going to pay for it in like-kind payment advertising in his then 28-city newspaper chain across the country. Sounded like a good idea at the time. <clears throat> Four months later, the First World War started in Europe, uh, and probably for uh, uh, an array of reasons, but most importantly that reason, the deal never came to pass. There are a lot of other things that happened that caused it not to work, but that was probably the most important of them. This is a picture of another RN associate, Jim Irvine II. This is Jim Irvine <clears throat> of the 
Irvine Ranch in Orange County uh, fame. He was significant to RN for two reasons. Um, one, pardon my cough drops. I tend to get a lot of coughing when I talk like this so much, so bear with me, please. Um, he um, and RN bought the largest piece of land that RN ever bought, which is a 13,000 acre carpenter track um, in what became the city of Moraga. The two of them uh, laid out the subdivisions and essentially commenced the planning for that city. <clears throat> I think more importantly, though, Jim Irvine was the only partner of RN's who stuck by him when everything went south on him. Jim Irvine believed in him, believed he could work his way out of his debts, and uh, stuck with him really uh, until the time Jim Irvine died in 1947. Their relationship by that time um, was uh, not what it had been in earlier years. But Irvine was a, was a loyal partner and friend of Burgess. This <clears throat> is a picture of a man named Henry Tiffany Scott. Henry Scott was the younger brother of Irving Scott. The two of them ran a company known as the Union Iron Works in San Francisco in the late 19th and early 20th century. The Union Iron Works started as a steel plate shop, morphed into a shipbuilding company, the first, largest, the first and largest on the West Coast. Indeed, they built the first two battleships for the United States Navy that were built on the West Coast. Irving Scott died in 1903. Henry stayed on <clears throat> the, uh, with the company on the board, but then went into finance, <clears throat> becoming the president, chief executive officer of the Mercantile Bank, um, which was RN's financial partner, and a number of other San Francisco corporations, including the St. Francis Hotel Company and several others. He was an important mentor of RN's because he represented to RN everything that a young immigrant from Canada wanted to get and wanted to become. He wanted, to, he wanted acceptance in his new community. <clears throat> and Scott brought him in, introduced him to investors. RN was smart, did what he said he was going to do, did it on time, brought his jobs in under budget, and he was a golden boy. He made a lot of money for himself and Scott and his friends. When RN went down, Scott did not stay with him. That relationship ended at that point. <clears throat> the two of them, got together in 1916 or so, towards the end of that year, when it was becoming apparent that the United States would go into the war against Germany, and um, uh, began to think about the prospects involved in shipbuilding. Prior to World War I, most of the shipbuilding in the world had been done in Europe, and it, after the start of the war, it was impounded, so there was a critical shortage of ships in the United States and shipbuilding capacity which in contemplation of going to war was obviously a problem. So these two men and several others got together to talk about the prospects for building a shipyard, another shipyard in the Bay Area. RN had a piece of property up on, a large piece of property he had acquired in 1908, which had adjacent to it a parcel with a deep water port. <clears throat> that parcel was owned by the Crocker Land Company. RN said he thought he could option it at a reasonable price and get the land and they could build a shipyard and build some ships. Scott said, go to Washington and check it out. RN went to Washington with Scott's young cousin, John Scott, who was the shipbuilding part of the team, the technical expertise, if you will. RN came back several months later with an order for 10, 10,000 ton freighters. <clears throat> he says the first such order let, I'm not sure that's true. He says he was designated the youngest shipbuilder in America. That could conceivably be true, it seems to me, given his timing. He came back, <clears throat> built the town of Clyde to house all the shipyard workers, built the shipyard, built and delivered all 10 ships, the last of which came down the ways in 1922, <clears throat> but the first of which, the SS Diablo, came down the ways on the 30th of November, 1918, exactly 19 days after the armistice was signed in Europe. <clears throat> and Fish, his wife was the sponsor of this at this launching. Um, the <laughs> exact reverse of that lack of demand for shipping occurred <clears throat> in November of 1918 uh, after the armistice, and shipbuilding demand collapsed. Many of the contracts were canceled, not RNs, as I've said. He delivered all 10 ships. 
By the time of the 10th ship delivery, he was out of the business for several years. The business was called the Pacific Coast Shipbuilding Company. Uh, uh, you know, Pacific Coast Shipbuilding Company. So he did all these things and many more, <clears throat> all essentially by his 40th birthday. He achieved success, recognition, and I think most importantly for a young immigrant from Canada, he achieved success and acceptance, I should say, in a peer group into which he aspired mightily. On the 10th of December, 1920, Jim Arvine put him into involuntary bankruptcy and it all ended. He initially resented that move, but then came to see it as a wise decision. What kind of a man accomplishes the things he did? In studying his life for three and a half years, three aspects of his personality stand out to me, a kind of a triad of traits, if you will, that will forever <clears throat> um, bring him to mind. First was a tremendous native intelligence and creativity. Second, a commitment to a lifetime of extremely hard physical and intellectual labor. <coughs> and third, and perhaps not so attractively, um, a combative streak in his personality. The evidence is that RN was a <clears throat> an extremely bright and um, uh, swift, quick learning student at the Danville eighth grade class, pictured here, 1994. <laughs> His instructor, um, A.J. Young, is pictured on your left, uh, the obviously non-student person in the picture. An RN is pictured on your on the on your uh, right in the very back row in the dark shirt just to your right of the center of the door. This is 1894 <clears throat> or 1895. The dates are not clear. <clears throat> the, out of out of the picture is the date of 1894. I think he was in. I think it might have been the class of 93. But no matter. A. J. was a storied teacher in Danville history. <clears throat> he taught there for in excess of three decades and uh, was a hard taskmaster. Master, if you learned something from AJ, it stuck with you, uh, contemporary accounts uh, tell us. In addition to that, AJ was an elder in the Presbyterian Church in Danville, the church in which RN's father, the Reverend Joshua Chase Burgess, was the pastor. So for five days a week, RN got his secular tutelage from A.J. Young in the classroom, and one additional day, he got his spiritual instruction from A.J. and others in the church. <clears throat> There's very little doubt in my mind that A.J. Young was probably the most important mentor in RN's early life. <clears throat> Talking a little bit about his intelligence and creativity, I, I think one episode, two episodes, um, will characterize for me, and I hope for you, what I mean when I say creativity and native intelligence. One had to do with his six or seven year tenure as the manager of the 10,000 acre Hookston Sugar Beet Ranch in Pleasant Hill. RN was at this point just under 20 years old when he got the job. He had a team of six or 700 Japanese laborers reporting to him um, who were bossed by uh, a team of Japanese labor bosses who reported to RN. RN reported to the California Sugar Beet and Refining Company in Crockett, and that's where he delivered his crop every year. One year, those um, bosses went on strike. Without the bosses, they couldn't do the harvest. Actually, it wasn't the harvest. It was the, the culling in mid-cycle mid of the year, which had to be done properly if the, if the harvest was going to come through successfully. They went on strike. The legal department of California Sugar Beet and Refinery couldn't solve the thing. It wound up in RN's lap. <clears throat> I've detailed in my book how he solved it. Suffice it to say, was he brought to what was a multidimensional problem, a cultural problem, if you will, a level of expertise that was astounding, really, for a man of his educational background and his experience to that point in life. Then there's the transaction uh, uh, accounting for surrounding the purchase of the Oakwood Stock Farm, the Diablo Country Club property, if you will, in uh, 1912. Um, in this transaction, the owner, who was a widow in San Rafael, didn't, uh, did want to sell her property, and indeed it had several previous buyers who had agreed to terms and conditions, but her attorney had killed the transaction in several, I think three preceding occasions, for reasons which are unknown. Presumably he didn't want her to sell the property. RN contrived to get around him, go to her in a way, 
exercising a level of creativity, which I think is, is quite astounding. Uh, and he, he got the deal, right under the lawyer's nose. Now, it's important to say that when we read his detailed accounts in his book of these transactions, and we reflect on the obvious pride in which he recounts his actions and steps that he took, steps that we would look at today, and I would look at today as a, as a, as a current, well, not quite current anymore, real estate finance person, um, were sketchy. <laughs> we wouldn't, you wouldn't do some of those things, and if you did, you probably wouldn't have your real estate license for too long. But he was obviously proud of these things, and it's important to recognize that when he was in business in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, this was a time when social Darwinism held sway, the, the perhaps inappropriate transference of Darwin's concepts in the natural world into the human world. And when the Spencerian concept of the survival of the fittest essentially was a byword in business, that's the context, that's the environment in which he worked. So if we think about it that way, it's natural to see him taking some pride in bragging about taking steps in doing business transactions that today we would look askance at. Then there was the, uh, the nickel for the, for the collection plate, which makes me think of a creative mind. When the two year, during the two-year period that they lived in San Francisco, RN parents gave him a nickel for the collection plate and sent him off to church one morning. He stopped at the candy store and bought um, a couple of sticks of licorice, which took two of the five cents, rationalizing it to his friends that the sound of the three cents thrown into the collection plate would be a lot more impressive than the sound of the... <laughs> of the nickel. In October of 1907, the Knickerbocker Trust Bank in New York City went under, causing a worldwide financial panic of serious and major proportions. Money was short throughout the developed world. When I say worldwide, I mean the developed world at that time. Remember, this is six years before the advent of the Federal Reserve System. Um, <clears throat> a young builder and San Francisco, or in that case in Alameda County, was not immune to these things. So this young builder, um, applying his creativity, took his um, book of loans from the sale of the homes that he had been building and selling to young families in his buckboard and came out to Contra Costa County to some of his former friends and clients, offering to swap his loans for their passbooks, essentially suggesting that his loans were more credit worthy than the banks on which the passbook accounts were written. Enough of them said yes to this that he was able to get through that difficult period of time. In 1908, he decided he needed to up his game, and he did so by moving to San Francisco. This is a picture of the building. Um, this is not the building, actually. The base of this building still stands. <laughs> at the intersection of uh, Montgomery Street, Post Street, and Market. Those of you who are familiar with the city will recognize that we're looking north on Montgomery Street uh, from a vantage point on Market Street. RN, to, to do this, to elevate himself, had to go to the city and essentially pitch himself to a bunch of financial um, leaders and, and, uh, and uh, uh, practitioners in San Francisco. And to do that, he created a mechanism for essentially ensuring that he could recycle his receivables, which to a builder was critical. You ran out of money, you didn't build any more houses, you didn't have any more money coming in. He developed a scheme, which I will not go into here, I'll give you just a sketch of it in a moment when we try to wrap this up, but suffice it to say, it was, it was good enough to convince several banks to take him on. He selected the Mercantile Bank and went to work with Henry Scott, the man whose picture we showed a moment ago. RN did all these things on the basis of an eighth grade education, which, which to me was an astounding thing. Hard work. He was a prodigiously hardworking man, intellectually and physically, all his life, from his childhood on the farm in Danville to his final days in Santa Barbara. He was also a very self-aware man. Um, and I think a little bit, maybe not, maybe a little theatrical. He was proud of this aspect of his personality, and his, proud, pride, his pride reflected itself in a quote that he put in his memoirs from a 19th century pundit named Charles Kingsley. The quote says so well and expresses so well these ideas 
that I thought I would read it. It's the epigraph to my chapter three. Quote, thank God every morning when you get up that you have something to do that day which must be done whether you like it or not. Being forced to work and forced to do your best will breed in you temperance and self-control, diligence and strength of will, cheerfulness and self-content, a hundred virtues which the idle never know. Charles Kingsley. That quote, in my mind, begged the question of what role in RN's development this man had. This is the Reverend Joshua Chase Burgess, who was edu educated in the Calvinist faith at Edinburgh at the bachelor's and master's degree level. And it seemed that he must have had an enormous impact on his sons. Uh, and the, the evidence that, that um, uh, we've been able to over, uh, uh, unearth indicates that rather than this strong relationship, his mother seems to have been the one who had the most effect on him. The affection that he evinces in his descriptions of his communications with his mother and, and back from her are such that they leave the reader wondering whether he had any relationship at all with his dad. RN was the third brother and older brother of one younger sibling, a, a uh, young uh, girl, on that farm in Danville between 1886 and 1895 when he left on the occasion of his 17th birthday to go into business for himself. The two older brothers took their turns running the farm, acting as a straw boss, uh, the Reverend Burgess being busy with his flock and not being particularly interested in farming. But as the older brothers matured, they wanted more in their life. They went on to Berkeley, one to become a prominent mining engineer in Reno, and one a lawyer. RN never left the farm until he left to go on his own. He never had any additional education other than when he got in that Danville Grammar School. He started as an eight-year-old cooking the meals for the workers on the farm. He ended up as a straw boss, a 15, 16-year-old boy with a 44 on one hip and a bag of gold coins on the other side making a payroll. He was also, by his own, in his own telling, quite adept with that 44. So he stayed there, he worked very hard, farm workers, hard work. He did that, he led the crew, made all kinds of relationships in the, in the fruit packing and growing business and shipping business, which served him in good stead when he went into business in his own. Also on hard work, I come to this picture. This is a, a picture and it's not really the point I'm trying to make, but it's interesting. This is the, this is the um, what was called the guest house. It's a home that still stands in Lakewood and your friends will be very familiar with this. Um, uh, Judy, my sister, and I lived in it for a few years during the war. Um, RN built it as a, as a marketing center for um, clients he was bringing out from the West Bay and from Alameda County to spend the weekend in while they evaluated his offerings of lots and potentially homes in this, what he hoped would be an idyllic setting in Lakewood. That's not the reason it's here, though. The Lakewood development remember, began uh, to come uh, to fruition at a time when RN was flat broke in the 1930s. He had no money to pay a crew. The few homes that were built during that decade, and most of the homes were built in the immediately, years immediately following the, the, uh, the war, RN built with Bob Green, his foreman, at a, at a, whom he paid a dollar a day. They graded the land, they poured the foundations, they built the, framed the houses, put in the doors and windows, put in the roofs, built the houses themselves. They were a crew of two. Again, extremely hard commitment to extremely hard work. They planted thousands of trees, which RN got from, from UC Berkeley, and then hand watered them through the drought of 30 and 31 to keep about 80% of them alive that would have otherwise died. Many of those trees, of course, are still in Lakewood today. And we have photos of RN in Santa Barbara working on his own roof, repairing it, in his mid-80s. R.M. Burgess was no stranger to hard work. There are countless episodes recounted in these memoirs of behavior which can only be considered combative, often inappropriately combative. Um, as a young boy growing up here in Walnut Creek, I well remember friends when we were in grammar school in the 1940s, Barney, <laughs> you were there. Uh, um, 
not having very nice things to say about R.N. Burgess. He was a hard guy to like. I think he was a hard guy to like if you were in business with him. And that came through. Probably the most salient example of this characteristic that I could find is the story of a land sale in Concord in 1911. R.N. had a giant parcel. I don't, when I say giant, I don't know how big it was. It was good size. Had it carved up into lots. He was going to have a lot sale, so he hired a, the local, what they call the silver band. He hired uh, food service, put up a big banner, hired a train to bring his land prospects out from um, Alameda and Oakland and Berkeley to buy parcels. Across the street was a similar parcel owned by a man named William Lyons, the president of the Bank of Concord. Lyons undertook to have his salesman get on the train in Martinez, one stop ahead of the Concord stop, and undercut RN's prices. They also took down his banner. You didn't do things like that to RN Burgess without expecting retribution, and indeed it was shortly forthcoming. It came to the knowledge of the state banking commissioner that Lyons, who was also developing a hotel in uh, Concord at the same time, might have been having some <clears throat> shortages with funds from his investors, of funds from his investors, and perhaps mixed them inappropriately with some bank funds. Uh, it didn't take long for Lyons to no longer be the CEO of the bank, and indeed, <clears throat> within a few months, RN owned that bank himself. <laughs> I hasten to add in telling this story that research in the, con in the Concord uh, Historical Society, which covers William Lyons and his light, life, is completely silent on this episode. <laughs> so, then there was an incident in San Francisco during the earthquake day when a young man approached him with a um, loaf of bread under his arm, long loaf of French bread, and RN said to the man, a half a loaf or a fight. He didn't need to fight the man. He had just been given free food by grocers who were giving it away during the tragedy. Um, but again, it's of a piece with a number of other episodes in the book that make you wonder what were the sources of these, of these impulses. Were they stature? RN was not a big man. He was probably 5'6 or 5'7. Um, hubris, quite possibly, particularly during the early part of his life. He was a really proud guy. Um, um, need for attention, theatrics, we've seen that, I think possibly, or was there some other propensity to physical confrontation? And then there was his fancy for guns. All his life he packed, literally, right up until the end. And I have in my epilogue uh, my own experiences as a seven-year-old boy <laughs> observing that feature of his life. Where these things come from is his of course, impossible to say, but they point to a complex personality, which is what made him so fascinating to me. You can't understand Burgess without understanding his marriage to Ann Webster Fish. <clears throat> Ann Webster Fish and RN were married in July of 1909 in a home in Berkeley, which still stands on Piedmont Avenue, which RN had built for his future mother-in-law the year before. Her participation in his, in his life is very important because at the time of their marriage, RN took 155 acres of the 1,500 acre or so San Miguel Ranch, which includes Lakewood, and put it in her name in anticipation of difficulties that he might encounter in his risky business later in life. Um, in addition to that, in consequence of which, of course, the home was saved. In addition to that, and perhaps more important, Ann Fish inherited money. When her mother died, she was the sole surviving child, uh, in 1923, she inherited that money. That enabled this family to grow in a very nice fashion in Lakewood in the 30s and 40s during a time when RN would have otherwise been flat on his financial back, unable to do anything. To me, the interest in that union, and I entitled my chapter the, A Propitious Union, is fascinating because <clears throat> RN brought into that union great social capital, the social capital that attends being the son of a Presbyterian minister in the early 20th century, late 19th, 20, 19th century, perhaps not so much today, but in those times, certainly. And brought into it great social capital as well as financial capital. RN married into a family rich in the American story. This is Lafayette Fish. His father-in-law, whom he never knew, Lafayette died in 1900, 
Lafayette fish came across the plains at least twice, possibly three times, came around the Isthmus once. <coughs> the true California pioneer came to the diggings in Marysville in January of 1850 with two brothers, made their fortunes, came to Contra Costa County, began buying up land, which they did in Contra Costa County and out in the Central Valley. So much acreage that when the decade of the 1880s and the great grain exporting decade occurred, they were, they were beneficiaries of that, um, uh, that uh, uh, event. RN's father, Liv uh, Lafayette's father, Libya's Fish, was one of the founders of the Republican Party in a convention in 1854 in New York. Six years before that party nominated Abraham Lincoln. <clears throat> With his brother Charles, he was reputed to be one of the first two millionaires in Contra Costa County. In 1888, Lafayette married a young school teacher at the San Jose State Normal School, Francis um, Webster. Francis Webster was a college-educated, uh, cultured, and well-traveled woman whose roots go back, went back very far in the American story with antecedents serving in the uh, Continental Army and uh, in the Union Army during the Civil War. So <clears throat> they came together in a union that brought social capital into a, 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 uh, with a, into a family that had both social and financial capital. I'm not suggesting by these comments that I think RN married Anne for her love. I have no idea of that uh, kind of thing, of what motivations persisted there. I am saying that it served him extremely well. And to understand his life and its whole, we have to take into consideration that marriage. And I'm on my third hearing aid warning. I guess, I guess it's not so important that, that, that I can hear you, but you have to hear me. So. so the question we get to is what happened here? This is, can get extremely complicated. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to avoid that by saying that to think about what happened to RN and his financial partners, we need to think about a typical home transaction in 1907, 1908, 1909. The home was sold typically for about $10,000 with a 10% uh, down. The loan was carried by the seller, RN in this case, under what was called a land contract, not a note and deed of trust the way we would do it today. Um, RN would take that loan, which he had title to until the loan was paid off, and potentially put it in a more, into a, a mortgage bank or into a trust bank. It was a trust bank. The trust bank, being a fiduciary, could certify the value of the loan vis-a-vis -vis the value of the underlying collateral. So it was a $10,000 house with a $9,000 loan on it. It could be sold as an income stream to an investor. The sale of those documents, which were known as certificates of participation, was under the auspices of the state insurance department and banking, both in combination insurance and banking department. It was a wonderful system for recycling capital, which this guy with an eighth grade education came up for, and it worked extremely well, as long as that $10,000 house was worth $10,000. Eight years later, when it was worth $5,000, it didn't work so well anymore. And there was a lot of exposure. Between 1908 and 1916, it was a fabulous thing for RN and his colleagues. So solving the mystery. <clears throat> what was, <coughs> pardon me, what was RN's role or involvement in all of this um, that led to such a dire outcome for himself, the banishment, the ostracism? Without giving away my book, my best <clears throat> estimate is some combination of a fall guy and a guilty party. The rules regarding the issuance of those certificates of deposit were the subject of legislation in 1913 and then again in 1915. In that two-year period, the rules became progressively more uh, restrictive. <laughs> Excuse me. The evidence is that RN did not keep up with those changes in rules. His failure to do that, this error of omission, addressing it charitably, or error of commission, less charitably, proved fatal for himself, not fatal <laughs> physiologically, but proved devastating for RN and for his financial <clears throat> partners. The, most importantly, the backdrop against which these errors occurred was such that recovery was impossible. Four main themes impacted his inability to get back on his feet. One, 
the tight regulations which I've mentioned, which the evidence is he didn't keep up with. <clears throat> Second, two macroeconomic events, one a recession of 1918-1919, in which unemployment soared, output dropped dramatically, <coughs> um, and business in general slowed down, and then a depression between January of 20 and August of 21, same outcomes, exacerbated by a, house, a, second, a housing collapse of major proportions. Schiller, a guy at Yale who does work on housing, many of you are familiar with him, um, reports that housing prices began to trend down in late 1916, bumped up and down and trended down until 1929 when they began to rebound, but never reached their 1916 levels until the years immediately following World War II. This was exacerbated by legislation, the Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act of 1917, which exempted men and women in uniform from making their mortgage payments as long as hostilities persisted until a point six months after the end of hostilities, which in the event turned out to be April of 1919. Obviously not helpful legislation if you're in the lending and building business. Finally, and I think most importantly, the influenza epidemic of 19. 19 to 1922, which killed millions of people worldwide, an estimated 500 to 650,000 Americans died from a virus which attacked otherwise healthy young people, destroying their immune systems, contradistinction to viruses which typically attack young or the very old. It essentially wiped out the cohort of the population that would have been buying homes and starting households. It was not a good series of events <clears throat> to be um, to occur. Uh, as a backdrop for RN's failure to keep up with those regulatory changes. Mercantile banks' exposure was broad. They had syndicated those certificates of participation to correspondent banks all over the country. And a set of circumstances not unlike what we saw in 2007 and 2008, you had lots of banks out there with millions of dollars of bad paper on their books. So RN Burgess went down. He lost his job. He lost everything, really. He lost his social standing. Um, he lost all his money, didn't lose his house, as we've said, <clears throat> but he went down and spent the next 25 years trying to come back. As to his guilt in all this, I'll leave to your reading. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give Jim another hand. Can you speak into the mic? Yeah, I'm going to go Oh. You know, I, I think it's very rare that we are in the midst of a living pioneer. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and uh, quite a life RN had. First of all, any questions from the audience? Sure. Jim, so when you were 10 to 15, your mother told you amazing stories about your grandfather. How did your book change that image? Can you repeat the last part of that question? So your mother told you an amazing story about your <coughs> grandfather when you were 10 to 15. Then you researched the book. I think Oops. this hearing aid has already gone. Fortunately, I have Mark. <laughs> yeah, the question is, uh, as I can ret retell it, when you were 10 to 15 years old, how did your grandfather recount stories to you about his early life? To you? Uh, he, 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 he didn't, Ed. Excuse me, your mother, not your grandfather, your mother retelling. She didn't. Second. But then how did the book change? How did doing the book change what you heard from your mother? Um, I, I heard virtually nothing from my mother about her father's life, uh, other than the fact that he was a, a hard-working guy. And, and um, it, was, it was almost as if um, there was a desire not to talk about those things. And on reflection and understanding his life, as I now do, I see why, but no, very little conversation, at least in our, I have two siblings here who might correct me on this, but at least in our family, that's the way it was, I think. I was just wondering, I go to the Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street. I'm a member. <laughs> yes, and, but is that the building you're speaking of? Because now the McKesson, you know, they're redoing the... No. That's not the building. The building that I'm talking about is um, just down 
um, the block at the intersection of Montgomery Street and Post Street and Market. And it's not there anymore, just the base of it is there. It's a triangular building on the corner. Okay, 57 Post Street is up the street. How many houses in Lakewood were developed by your grandfather? The question is, how many houses in Lakewood were developed by RN? Gosh, I, I, there are people in this audience that can answer that question better than I. My estimate is somewhere between 150 and 250, and something like that. Do you know if these were eight or nine? Say again. Yeah, the Adobe's were a very low number, eight or nine. Yeah. The total development, I, w I would think probably in the range of a couple of hundred, 175, 200, something like that. I don't know. Turlu Brady has written a marvelous book on that, and she has all the detail of Lakewood. Uh, 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 it was very helpful research in my work, but I don't know the answer to the question. I have a follow-on uh, comment on Lakewood, because since we are on the 100th year anniversary of the suffrage movement, uh, Anne Fish was highly influential to RN's recovery, if you will, in building Lakewood. Do I have that somewhat right? Uh, and my question is, um, how formative was Lafayette Fish's inheritance to Anne to help him recover? And were those, any of those revenues used to help build Lakewood? Um, I, I don't believe so. He took pride in the memoirs announcing how, uh, describing how he didn't commingle funds. He talked about his uh, role in helping her manage her investment portfolio, which consisted of, interestingly enough, a portfolio of stocks and bonds, but also a lot of land in the Central Valley, which her father had owned, having bought back in the 19th century. He helped her with some of those things, but um, uh, I, I don't think he was actively involved in borrowing money from her from that purpose. Exactly. He did borrow money to buy back the property later that he had gifted to her, but that was only related to the, to and the one, one final company. thought. Lafayette Fish, is that the basis of the name of the city of Lafayette? No. Okay. Different Just family. Just a coincidence. Different family. Okay. Yeah. Slip Madigan was a coach at uh, St. Mary's in the 30s, I think. And he went on to uh, be a property developer in Contrast County. Was there any professional relationship between RN and Slip Madigan? Not that I know of, Denny. Uh, he never mentioned it in his uh, memoirs. It, it seems to me that it's probably quite conceivable that their paths crossed. Remember, it wasn't, it was a much smaller place then. Everybody seemed to know everybody else, at least reading his memoirs, but, but Slip Madigan's name was not, and I would have noticed that because I know his story. Is it time to wrap it up? Oh, what, I'm sorry, I need you to repeat your, your comment. Slip Madigan at St. Mary's, is that right? A coach at St. Mary's. Well, give me the question again. He answered it. I know. The right. question, the question was, did Slip Madigan, the ex-coach or the former coach at St. Mary's, have a professional real estate uh, relationship yeah. with RN? Thank you. Susan wants me to repeat the question again, but I'm not going to do that. All right. <laughs> My question, Jim, is, is um, what surprised you in your research? Did you discover anything about your, your, your grandfather that you didn't expect to discover? Okay, what did you in your research discover that you didn't know before? I think only just innumerable specific details of specific parts of his life. Nothing overriding. I felt that I, I knew the man much better. I, I started out to write a character study and I think I did that. I think I now understand his character. But because I didn't know him really at all, Lisa, there was nothing to sort of surprise me when I got into it. Yes. So if World War I hadn't happened, what was the vision for Hearst and your grandfather would have talked about the other? So if World War I would not have happened, what was the vision of RN and Hearst? Well, the vision was, um, as articulated by RN in describing that four-hour ride up Mount Diablo, <laughs> that they would build a, 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 a big edifice up there on the top, a big hotel. They would have a grand boulevard, uh, 
uh, um, bordered by trees that were, would, were purchased from the University of California, <laughs> lining the side of the road. They would have all manner of uh, entertainments and so forth. But I know from my discussions with David McKeezy of the Mount Diablo Country Club, who wrote a wonderful book about the history of that institution, that the key to understanding that relationship was Hearst's relationship with his mother, Phoebe, uh, and Phoebe's relationship with RN. Hearst, um, under the terms of his father's will, um, uh, when, his dad, when his dad, Senator George Hearst, died, he left half of his money to his wife and the other half in trust for maybe his son, but totally at his wife's discretion, in consequence of which RN was um, incented to maintain a good relationship with his mother, Phoebe. He did. RN's, in RN's telling, Phoebe asked RN to watch out for Willie shortly before she died. She died of the influenza epidemic in, in uh, 19. But after her death, he got almost all that other half, 90% of it or so. Um, uh, Hearst lost interest in RN and lost interest in Diablo um, and began to concentrate on his mother's property across the valley, the Castlewood Country Club, and other matters in his newspaper business. So I think had World War I not, um, I think that partnership, Ed, was going to come a cropper with or without World War I. But World War I was definitely the, cl the catalytic movement that rendered it essentially you know, a, a, a no-go. Jim, can you talk a little bit about uh, the influence of RN just seizing on various opportunities? I was particularly struck by the shipbuilding portion of his career when he not only built Clyde, but as I understand it, also built housing for the workers in Bay Point. He just managed to capitalize on both ends of the transaction. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, that's an interesting part of the story because the historians who have done work on the city of Bay Point um, write, paint a, a, a less flattering picture of the circumstances than RN does in the memoirs. Specifically, they wanted, uh, according to this one historian, um, the residents of Bay Point wanted the housing for the shipyard workers to be in Bay Point. But that was not land that RN controlled. RN controlled a parcel that he had purchased, as I mentioned, in 1908, which is a very large piece of land, all the way from the water up the northern slopes of Mount Diablo. Um, so he built the town and named it Clyde, after the, the river in Scotland where the big shipyard is there. That didn't endear him to the citizens of, um, of Bay Point. And so I think he was, you know, he was a shrewd guy. He was an operator, and he knew what he was doing. <laughs> so, That's good. Uh, one more thing. I mean, I was, it reads like a page out of Downton Abbey in parts of this book. I mean, it really is interesting. I want you all to read the book, can you tell? Um, talk a little bit about the heroics of RN uh, during the earthquake, specifically when he commandeered the carriage to get out to the hospital and deliver them supplies. I found that fascinating. It is an interesting aspect of his personality and, and um, keeping in mind that these events are all self-described. Um, yeah, yeah. Nonetheless, I, I think from never, other never done by Hollywood, of course. From, from other from other aspects of his of his story, I think much of that is probably true. He was an assertive and aggressive young man. He was bold in that in a in a in a problem situation, he had a, he had a mind quick enough to seize um, uh, the uh, solution to the way out, if you will. And in the instance that Mark is talking about, the um, the doctor that ran a, what was called the McNutt Hospital, which was being in the process of being slowly evacuated, <clears throat> was reluctant to leave. The RN came up <clears throat> going west with literally the flames and the smoke not far behind him. And Dr. McNutt said, no, we'll be all right, we'll stay here. And RN said, no, the, the fire is a block away. And uh, you need to, you know, to take your materials, which included apparently Dr. McNutt, McNutt's art collection, out of the hospital and get it away from here. So RN organized the uh, hospital workers to uh, evacuate all the health-related equipment as well as the art. But there, there was a drayage issue. RN found a, a wagon on Van Ness Avenue that was sitting there, asked him what he wanted. And the guy said 300 bucks for something that perhaps in, the, in that day might have cost $1.50 or something like that. RN said, done, I'll take the wagon. He got in the wagon and directed the man. They went back to the hospital, picked up all the stuff, and took it 
to McNutt's home. That um, story to me rings very true. It, it strikes me as being just the kind of thing that Burgess would have done, being in a crowded, confused situation, seeing a solution, and acting <clears throat> uh, to affect it. Yes, he, that was his idea, Kathy. He um, partnered with William Randolph Hearst, but the partnership, as I said, was um, had to do with the ownership of the land and RN <clears throat> and others putting in sweat equity, building the place, if you will, and Hearst <coughs> providing the promotional aspects of it through his newspaper chain. But RN Burgess essentially founded the club and built it. So she's asking about the, uh, I guess, the proximity of Claremont and other country clubs and how that affected the decision to build the Diablo Country Club? Right. You know the Claremont Country Club mm -hmm. right on the Berkeley Claremont Avenue Country Club. Border. Yeah. There was a great connection there. George McNear, RN's friend and the son of one of RN's um, early um, nemesis, George McNear Sr., was a grain king. <clears throat> um, McNear was a member of Junior was a member of um, Claremont, and um, through that relationship, I think RN imported uh, some world class golfers, either from Claremont or from Claremont and their relatives directly from Scotland, to come to build the course at Diablo. Again, for those golfers who are interested in that um, aspect of it, McKeezy's book is outstanding. But there's a definite linkage between the Claremont Country Club and Diablo. And there were just a handful of those world-class clubs in the first several decades of the, of the 20th century. And RN's idea was that Diablo would be in that group. And that would be like St. Andrews over in the north of Scotland? Yeah. yeah. Okay, time for one more question. What was it like to grow up in an area where everywhere you looked nearby held some family history? Marianne asked the question. I'm going to remind her that the house that he built was your Pi Phi sorority, and it still stands and still in, still in operation today. Well, it was interesting, but I think, Marianne, I had not, uh, I was interested in other things as a young man. I really didn't have an appreciation for it until I got a lot older and began to dig into his life, probably quite typically. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much.